so basically we'll be talking a lot more about how to write clean code and that has become such an important skill so companies like flipkart companies like titan spinny all of these companies have an extensive low level design round apart from problem solving round and the reason is that people who are even good at problem solving who are very good at data structures algorithms sometimes do not know how to write code which is easily readable which is easily extendable so all these concepts come very handy to write a very readable code to write a very maintainable code so vivek will talk more about it and we'll start the session so we will be doing a lot of lot of coding in the session so you'll have to be on your toes if you have any friends you want to make them join you can join and i'll also meet you mostly after the session but meanwhile if you uh, get some time you can just go to uh, programming patshala's low level design course and take a free trial in that uh, course we have taught low level design in a much more depth so yes we'll start with the session and uh, vivek will take over from here Hi everyone, am I audible? You can just type in yes or no if you can hear me. Okay. Okay, great. That means we can start. Uh, okay. Uh, before we get started, I just want to know like how many of you are um, like professionals. Like if if you work for an organization, if you're not in college, then you can just type in a yes if that's the case. Okay. 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 Great. Uh, quite a lot. Uh, cool. Now, uh, how many of you are here who are, uh, you know, uh, who are probably hearing about low level design for the first time, or uh, you you have heard it but you feel like you don't know much about it? So you can just say yes if if that's the case. Okay. So. Uh, so let us first uh, talk about uh, the very basic things to uh, you know set the forum right and then we can probably go on into uh, intricate details of things right so um, you know uh, like uh, all of you code right all of you are programmers so all of you write code for your organizations but uh, but tell me just one uh, very simple thing uh, whenever you raise a code review and uh, somebody has to review your code uh, does that person only look at the functionality part of it what i mean by functionality is that uh, does he feel convinced if the code uh, takes in the correct output and gives the right output is that is that just enough the answer is no that's not enough because uh, you can have a code which is very poorly organized okay and still it produces the right output so if you remember the first code that you might have written uh, when you would have started to code what kind of variable names did you use you used variable names like int i j k you gave function name like func and all you, you did all the sorts of things right uh, but do you do that in your uh, organization or do you do that while building a, a good project or contributing to an open source do you ever do that you don't do that what is the reason behind that the reason is that you don't just write code for machines to compile and run rather you write code for your fellow developers to understand and to make changes to it because tomorrow if you leave the company and somebody else has to uh, step into your shoes he should be able to understand what are the features that are supported right now and he or she should be able to you know quickly uh, get hold of what the code does right so the first aspect is uh, you know uh, readability and maintainability uh, a code which is uh, written well should be uh, should not take too much of efforts to be understood by others so that's an important thing to understand another thing is that i'll tell you i'll give you a, probably a very simple example um code which is not designed well which is very very unorganized 
uh, such kind of code is very fragile by nature. Okay, so I'll just quickly share my screen and I'll probably try to relate a few things. What is a fragile code? You might have heard of this thing, this term a lot from different, different people, even from your senior developers, I believe you would have heard these things. So um, I'm just sharing my screen. You can let me know if it's visible. Okay. Um, can you guys see this Google Doc? It's just an empty Google Doc. Is it visible? Yeah. Okay. Great. So. Uh, Let's let's just take a very simple example. I'm just trying to uh, talk about uh, things through easy to understand examples. So uh, let's say you decide to uh, give competition to WhatsApp and you decide to build your own uh, company in that uh, in that domain. Let's say it's called maybe Snapchat. That already exists. Anyways, it doesn't matter what the name is, but let's say you want to build a new company which gives competition to WhatsApp. Now, uh, what is the primary motive of that company? The primary feature that it should support is that uh, people should be able to send messages to each other, right? People should be able to send messages to each other. So you can say that, hey, uh, to start with, uh, I'll make sure that people are able to exchange text messages uh, in between them. So if there is a person A, he should be able to send a text message and that should be well received by person B. And then person B can also revert back with another text message. So let's say you have built this much part of your system. So people are able to uh, seamlessly communicate uh, via sending text messages. Everything is good so far. Uh, but let's say tomorrow you realize that, hey, you know, uh, WhatsApp and other uh, messaging platforms, they don't just allow for text messages. They also allow things like emojis and GIFs and files and videos and multimedia and all such sorts of things, right? Yes or no? So now you feel that, hey, you have to start supporting other forms of messages also. You have to start supporting multimedia messages also. So what is what is this kind of scenario known as this scenario is something which is called as extension so basically you want that your system should extend to varieties of message formats in essence this is all that you want right now if a code is poorly designed in that case it would be very tough it would be very hard to introduce a new format of message. When I say tough, when I say hard, what I mean is that you might have to, you know, uh, scroll through your entire code base and performs hundreds of lines of code changes in hundreds of packages and, you know, different, different code files. So if that is the case, if you have to, uh, you know, rip off your code base again, that means whatever was designed earlier was not a proper design. But if, the changes that you have to make are quite less and quite less painful compared to what you had to do in the first place. That means it's a good code. So one huge benefit, I would say, of uh, low-level design is that it allows for easy extensions. So if you have to introduce a new feature, it doesn't cause tremendous pain. It is much more easier to do compared to uh, a code which is very much fragile in nature. So two things, readability, uh, a well-written code should have a very high readability. Something which is readable is maintainable also. And second thing is extensibility. It should be uh, easy to you know, uh, plug a new feature without ripping the code base apart. Uh, is that making sense? How many of you uh, understand these two aspects of low-level design? Because before we get started, we need to know that what exactly it is that we are trying to achieve through low level design. A quick yes or no would send me some signals if you guys are able to relate on it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, a very easy example to see. Um, let's say, um, let's say YouTube. Let's take example of YouTube. 
Now, uh, on YouTube, there are different forms of resources. Like you have got reels, you have got videos, and you have got so many other things, right? And now, uh, you know, there are certain reels or certain videos which are not supposed to be viewed or played by a child who is below, let's say, 18 years of age, right? Now, in the entire code base of YouTube, there will be different APIs, there will be different functions, okay? So let's say there is a function somewhere uh, which says, uh, the name of the function is view reel, and this function takes in some input. One of the input is user, and then it has some code written inside it, right? Similarly, you will have some other function written in some other package. Let's say that is view uh, review. And this again takes some parameters and it also takes user. And now uh, you have hard coded some piece of information. When I say hard coded, let's say you have written a piece of code like this. You have written if uh, user dot age is uh, smaller than equal to 18, then I'll not allow this user to view this reel because this content is not supposed to be viewed by children. Okay, now this value 18, you can see that it is hard coded. So, so you can very much expect it to be present here also. And it could be present in some other function also. It could be present across different, different packages, different, different code files. And now just think one thing, uh, let's say the, management uh, team of YouTube, it, it figures out that, hey, the age limit for us is not 18, rather it is 16. Now you will have to perform that code change everywhere. I mean, because you had hard coded this value 18, you will have to go to all the different packages, search for all the files, and you'll have to change it to 16, 16, 16, 16 everywhere. And if you miss even at one place, then that's like a poor experience that, that then that will be just like, that will be counted just like a bug, right? So, I mean, this was a very, very simple uh, example. I mean, uh, this is just a, a bare minimal uh, thing, but I just wanted to tell you that such kind of code is a fragile code because the change that you have to do is not a very uh, smart sort of change. You just have to uh, uh, change a config you have to change the number 18 to 16. And in order to do that, if you have to change across everywhere and send code reviews, then that's a very pathetic experience. Have you ever experienced something like this? Anyone who ever experienced something like this where you had to do a small code change, but that incurred making changes across different packages and different files. I'm pretty sure that if you guys are coding and uh, if you guys have worked with uh, variety of code bases, you would at least once in your lifetime have encountered a code like this. Okay, so what could be a very simple fix here? So if somebody has to, uh, let's say, change this, he or she would say that, hey, uh, do not hard code things. Uh, let's create another configuration file. And inside that configuration file, so let's say you have some config file, or it could be a code file also, let's say, it's a constants file. And here you can store something called as age limit. And this age limit is equals to 18 for now. And now the comparison that you are doing, you are doing it with that age limit. Now it means that if somebody has to, you know, um, uh, change the age limit from 18 to 16, that person will just have to change this value in this file. He'll just have to change this from 18 to 16. And that's it. Everything else will work like a charm. Correct. So this is a better place to be in. This is example of a non-fragile code. So it was just a quick example to get you guys started. Hope you understand what I meant by the fragile code and all sorts of things. And it is much more readable also because earlier somebody who could be reading 18 and 16, he or she could not understand what this 18 is. But now it says age limit. So he can figure out from the name itself, he or she can figure out that, okay, uh, there is some sort of limit that is imposed and probably it can have better name also, maybe child age limit or something like that. But yeah, these are some uh, super, uh, you know, benefits of uh, low level design. So what we are going to do today is, we are going to see that, uh, you know, when you have to write a code, let's say you are building your own project, your solo project, you are working for an organization. To start with, you do not feel the need of low level design. Why? Because there are very, uh, very few 
features that you have to support. You have to support very few features and you feel like, hey, I don't need it. But as the time passes, systems become complicated. Systems becoming complicated means that there are many more features that the product team brings in and wants them to be supported. And when those features come in, then as a consequence of that, so many if-else conditions, so many, I would say, nasty if-else conditions start getting introduced in your code base. That is the point of time when you start to feel the pain. Because too many if-else conditions, that means a code might not be doing one thing at a time, multiple things. It is very hard to test such a code. It is very hard to understand such a piece of code, right? Uh, can you relate to me on this? I mean, have you ever experienced something like this? That when you started off, the code was very simple, but when new features came in, more if-else conditions got added, and then it was like a nightmare to uh, maintain such a, such, a, such a sort of code, right? Okay, cool. So what we'll do is we'll do a quick exercise where we will... Uh, so all of these things that I have said, I have just said, I have not... Uh, given concrete examples. So I'll try my best to give a concrete example through a uh, quick exercise, quick and interesting exercise, I would say. So let's say um, you are sitting for an interview, right? Uh, how many of you are already good with DSA? Can you just type in yes? Not good, how many of you understand basics of DSA? Like some simple DFS, BFS, do you guys understand that much? What is graph entry? You all understand that, right? Okay. So uh, let's say you are sitting for a um, DSA interview uh, with uh, Microsoft and then your interviewer says that, hey, uh, there's a question that I have for you. And the question is that, uh, uh, let's say there are certain places. So this is a place A, okay. this is a place B. These are just different tags of the places. This is a place C. That's a place D. And then there are connectivities between these places. So let's say uh, there is a direct connection from A to C. And then there is a direct connection from uh, uh, B to D. And then there is a direct connection from, uh, let's say, A to B. Uh, so you will be given such sort of data where there'll be places and there'll be connections. And now, you will be given a source and destination. So let's say your source is B and your destination is D. So you have to check whether you can go from B to D or not, right? So in this case, you can go from B to D so you can return true. But if let's say your source is uh, B and destination is C, what will you return? Will you return true or false? False, because there is no way I can go from B to C. So, so if let's say just this much is what you have to support, just this much, then what will you do? You will say that, hey, I can model this problem like a graph problem and I can probably uh, run a quick DFS and I can check whether there is a path from A to C or not, whether, whether, whether there is a path from a particular node to any other, other node or not. Using DFS, we can, we can all do that, right? Uh, now, so this could have been a problem in your DSA round. You would have nailed it, very good. But now you progress to low level design round. Now the interviewer says that, hey, you know, we want to build a game. And it is a very special kind of game. In this game, let's say there are uh, uh, multiple planets in the universe. Okay. Now at each planet, there is a vehicle. At each planet, there is a vehicle, and uh, that vehicle could be uh, a car, it could be a boat, it could be anything. It could be a jeep. It, it could literally be anything, right? And um, planets are connected through different mediums, different mediums. Uh, what I mean by different mediums is, so let's say there are two planets. Uh, this is Mars and this is Venus. 
then there can be a connection from Mars to Venus, which is a waterway connection. So let's say there is a stream of water which flows from Mars and goes to Venus. So that's a waterway connection. Uh, and then there can be a roadway connection also. Let's say we have built road. It's a game, right? So it's a hypothetical game. So there can be roads, there can be water, there can be some other ether, any, any sort of connectivity can be there in between two planets. So it could be a roadway connection also, or it could be uh, airway connection. It could be, it could just be anything. So basically there are different forms of connections between different planets. And now uh, there are certain rules. So few rules are common sense based rules. For example, uh, if you talk about a car, it cannot, uh, car cannot uh, go through water. It's common sense because car is not capable of going through water. Similarly, uh, if you talk about a boat, a boat cannot go through a road, right? A boat cannot go through a road. But now let's say in boat also we have varieties. So there are certain boat which can have wheels, can have wheels. So let's say there are certain special kind of boats which have wheels underneath them. So if they have wheels, then they can go through road also, okay? So such kind of constraints are there. Such kind of rules and constraints are there. Uh, another constraint could be that uh, every road has a weight limit. So if there are two planets hanging in the universe and there is a road, then that road is just like a bridge. So that bridge or that road has a weight limit. So if your vehicle or if your boat has a weight, which is more than the weight limit, then it cannot traverse that. So such kind of rules are there. Okay. And now you are given a source and you are given a destination and you have to check whether a path exists from source to destination or not. So if a path exists from source to destination, you have to return true. And of course I can uh, augment this problem. I can say print the path, uh, but for now let's just determine whether there is a path from source to destination or not. Do you see that how this problem uh, now looks much, much simpler compared to this problem? So this is exactly what happens when you have a premature system and many more feature comes in and then it kind of becomes complicated, right? So that is exactly what happens in uh, progression from, uh, I would say, DSA round to low level design round or you know progression from uh, MVP minimum viable product to uh, something which supports multiple features and is scalable extendable and also sorts of things right so uh, this will be the nature of problem that you can expect in low level design interviews uh, is that making sense before we proceed from here can you guys quickly try type in a yes or no in terms of okay so i just want to know whether you get the difference between the nature of DSA problem and nature of low level design problem or not. If you get that, then we are good to proceed from here. Okay, I hope you get that. Uh, now, at this point of time, see, uh, in this case, you could simply have written a recursive method, a DFS method, where you could have uh, taken the current node and you can model a graph. Uh, how do you model a graph? How do you represent a graph in, in, in the form of your code? Yeah, you could have used an adjacency list or adjacency matrix, something like that. So you could have built an adjacency list for this graph and you could have just got your job done, right? Do you think that the same code that you would have written here would work in this case also? The answer is no, not at all. Why? Because here, just, just try building a random graph just for the sake of understanding. Let's say uh, there is a planet. This is uh, planet P and then that's planet Q. And uh, at planet P, uh, let's say you have a car. 
And at planet Q, let's say you have a boat. And uh, let's say uh, there is a connectivity from P to Q. And this connectivity uh, is a water connectivity. And then there is another connectivity also from the P to Q. So mind it, there can be multiple edges. You can have multiple edges from one node to another node. So in this case, let's say it is uh, um, roadway connectivity, right? And of course, for this roadway, you have some other inputs also, like uh, whether uh, what is the weight limit of this road and all sorts of things, right? And again, for uh, this car also, you have what is the weight of this car. For this boat, you have what is the weight of this boat and whether this boat contains wheels or not. So such sorts of things are given. Let's say there is another planet and that planet is uh, R. And here, uh, let's say you have a boat again. And let's say there is a connectivity. And this connectivity is a roadway connectivity. So such kind of graph will be given to you. And then, uh, so I have just drawn a small part of it, but there can be, uh, this graph can actually be huge. So now you will be given a source and you will be given a destination and you will be asked whether you can go from source to destination or not. So see, in this case, in this example, you just had to check whether there is an edge or not. If there is an edge, you can go from A to C. But can you do the same thing here? Let's say you are at P and you have a car. And if there is an edge, will you just blindly say that I can definitely go from P to Q? The answer is no. What kind of checks do you have to make? The checks that you will have to make will be that, hey, this is a car and this connection is waterway connection. So of course, I cannot use this connection. Okay, this connection is a roadway connection. I can use it subjected to the fact that the weight limit of this is more than the weight limit of car. Correct? So all these checks you will have to do. Now think of it in this manner. Can you already imagine some if else conditions creeping into your code? So the moment I spoke, you should ideally have imagined because when you look at a connection, you have to check that what is the type of that connection. If the type is water, no. If the type is road, then I have to do another if check that does the weight limit compare with that weight limit. So there are so many if else checks now. How about now? If you couldn't imagine if else checks that time, can you, can you imagine now? Can, can you see those if else checks creeping in, right? And as the system evolves, as we, uh, you know, uh, go on to say that now somebody says that, hey, uh, people will really love if we have uh, aeroplanes also as vehicles. Now, aeroplanes ca can have some other sort of constraints. And let's say there is some ether based connection, then that can have some other sort of constraints. So as more and more configurations creep in, your code will start getting dirty. At this point of time, you have to think, you have to design your code in a way that, you know, uh, it, it doesn't change. I mean, the major part of your code, what is the major part of your code? The major part of your code is the algorithmic engine of it, which is DFS part, which runs DFS and searches for a path. Now that should not be polluted if a random product manager says that I have to introduce a new vehicle or I have to introduce a new connection, that intelligence engine should not change. So if you, if you can design your code in a way, then uh, in a way that it does not change, then that's a, that's a great low level design. Now, how to achieve something like this? The way to achieve something like this is, so tell me one thing, how many of you are clear with the, some basic concepts of OOPs? like polymorphism, inheritance, and encapsulation. Do you guys understand that? <clears throat> Everyone else? <clears throat> okay. So uh, there is a very important concept through which we are able to design extensible systems, and that is polymorphism. What is the meaning of polymorphism? It means multiple forms. See, if else conditions comes inside your code, when there are multiple types. And then for multiple types, you need to have if else checks that if this connectivity is road, if it is water, for different, different connectivities, you have different, different, different logic. Using polymorphism, what you can do is that you can declare some super type. 
Uh, the super type can also be called as, you can call it as a parent class. And then there can be some child classes under it. So in order to introduce polymorphism, you first have to figure out that what components of your design are going to have multiple forms. Tell me, is planet going to have multiple forms? No, nobody told me that there'll be different types of planets. Yes, planets can have different name. So name is just a data. Data being different does not make things different, but behavior being different makes things different. This is a very important point to understand. The behavior of a car and behavior of a boat is different when they have to traverse a particular connectivity. So I would say that I can think of a super type vehicle and this super type will have a child type called as car under it and another child type called as boat under it. So both of them will inherit from this parent. Okay. Another thing that I can think of is that we can have multiple form of connections, right? So we can say that connection in our case can be a parent type, right? And then there can be a roadway connection and then there can be a waterway connection. So basically these guys are parents and these guys are all children, right? Okay, do, do you understand this point? How many of you get it? Yeah, yeah. some of you are talk talking about boat with and without wheel. So we'll see that whether we need to have a uh, wheeled boat and non-wheeled boat or can we model that, uh, you know, wheel thing as data. We'll see that, we'll see that when we'll write the code. But this much makes sense to all, right? I believe it should. Okay, uh, now at this point of time, so when I've explained this thing, uh, you also, I'll assume that you have some experience with polymorphism. And if you don't have, I'll give you a quick example. You have to uh, attend to it very carefully. Uh, if you attend to it, you'll be able to understand the remaining part of the code that I write. Okay, because I, I have to write code in a language. I have picked Java for that. But even if you don't know Java, you should be able to understand the gist of it. I mean, because the design patterns and design principles, they are not specific to language. If I can do it in Java, I can do it in Python, C++ also. Okay. So, um, so yeah, let me just show you my ID. So can you see my IntelliJ IDE? You can just type in, uh, yes or no? Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to uh, give a brief example of uh, polymorphism to everyone, and then we'll uh, get into the parts of it. There's a question here, connection is a parent class because the child classes have different behaviors. Yes, they have different behaviors, and I'll show you those behaviors. Just hold on for a while. Um, so there are multiple ways to, uh, you know, to, um, implement polymorphism in your code base. So there is something called as interface and there is also something called as abstract class through which you can do that. Okay, what is an interface? So interface is something uh, just like vehicle or just like connection, they are interfaces. So what are they? They are abstract types. They are just abstract types. Uh, they do not have body, okay? They don't have body. They just have some signature defined in them, okay? And those signatures are actually implemented by the child classes. Just think of it in this manner that uh, uh, there is an interface called as animal, okay? Now, an interface animal can have a empty method speak. Why that method is empty? Because the way a cat speaks is different than how a cow speaks or how a donkey speaks. So all those uh, donkey and cow and crow and everything, those would be child classes which will be implementing that interface. And when they implement that interface, they will be implementing their own body of this method. This is what 
they are supposed to do. So in this case, there is an interface item. It has an empty method uh, get ID which returns an integer. And now what I have done is, okay, this is just a toy example. This is to get all of you on the same page regarding polymorphism. So let's say there is a class that I have written. The name of this class is item A. Now item A, it implements item. Okay, because it implements item, so it is forced to implement that method, which is get ID. Okay, so you can see that it implements get ID over here, right? Now, uh, what it does in what it really uh, does in this method is not an important thing for us to understand because this this implementation could be simple, it could be complicated depending upon what kind of class it is. Uh, the logic to get ID could also be something like where you have to make a call to database and then get some ID and then return that. It could be anything or read a file or do anything, right? Uh, similarly, there is another class uh, called as item B. Now this also implements item and it has get ID method, right? Uh, now the important thing is that uh, if I, uh, let's say, go ahead and create a main class, And now it has a very simple method. Now, if I create an object of item A, this is the class item A. If I create an object of it, let's say I do new of item A, it has a constructor which needs ID and name. So let me just pass that. Let's say the ID is one and name is uh, foo. Now, uh, you know, as always, we can definitely do something like this. Item A, item A equals to this thing. So I can store this object in a type item A, but I can also store this object in a type item. I can do that. Why I can do that is because this object belongs to this class item A and this class item A is a child class of item. So any object of this can be assigned to item. It can be done. So that's a very important thing to understand. And now at this point of time, if I do something like uh, item dot get ID, then what will happen is that the get ID method, which is defined inside item A, that will get triggered. So the request will be dispatched over here. And then whatever is printed here will be printed and whatever is the ID here, that ID will be returned. So I can just play around with this. If I just run this piece of code for a while, you will see that because it contained a hello message here, you will see that hello will get printed, okay? So yeah, as you can see, hello has got printed, right? And now uh, let's say, uh, let's look at the get ID method, which I have implemented in item B. In item B, there is no uh, hello. I'm not printing any hello over here. So if I just change my code here, if, if I just make this item B, and now if I call item.getID, then this get ID call will be dispatched over here. Why? Because the type of this item, is item B now, it is not item A, right? So now if I uh, run this piece of code, you will see that that message, hello, it will not be printed. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, right now the code is running, but uh, yeah, you can see it has finished and nothing got printed, right? What is this? This is a dynamic behavior. This is a dynamic behavior. I mean, when I call get ID method on this item, then the behavior of this method changes during runtime. And it depends upon what object it was assigned to. If it was item B, then it behaves in accordance with item B. And if it was uh, item A, then it will behave in accordance with item A. Now just think of it in this manner that if you have a certain vehicle and you, you say vehicle dot move. Now, if that vehicle is a car, then it will move like a car because the method move, which is defined in the interface vehicle, will be implemented inside car. And if it was, uh, let's say cycle, then it will move like a cycle. But the important thing to understand over here is that somebody 
who is dealing with a vehicle will not have to worry about what is the type of that vehicle just think of it in this manner as long as i know that my input is a vehicle i can just do uh, v dot move without checking that what is its type because if i had not used polymorphism i had to check that hey if this vehicle is a car use this logic else if this vehicle is a cycle use this logic else if it is a let's say anything else rickshaw then use this logic right but now i don't have to do that i just have to invoke v dot move and depending upon the type of v the corresponding move method will be invoked uh, do, do you get this point how many of you understand this point this was just a very basic thing i wanted it to be very clear for everyone before we just move ahead okay just in case you do not understand this you need to refresh your understanding of polymorphism you need to revise that and then probably you'll be able to get hold of everything for now we can move on so uh, so what i am going to do is in the first place i would say let there be an interface vehicle okay let there be an interface vehicle and this interface vehicle it has a method traverse and this method traverse takes something called as connection and returns true or false because if you remember a vehicle has to traverse a connection right now if it is able to traverse it will return true and if it is not able to traverse it will say that hey i could not traverse so it will return something like false this vehicle has been made a uh, uh, interface for now keep it in your mind right how about connection we intended to make this connection also as an interface right so you can see there is another interface called as connection now this interface has several methods inside it so for now just focus on two methods there is a method called as get start island and get end island it makes sense because every connection starts from an island okay call it island call it planet whatever you want to call uh, the code that i have written that code is for island game but you can also call it for planet game so there is a start point and then there is an end point and there will be some identifier of the starting point and some identifying fire of the end point there are several other methods also so i'll talk about these remaining four methods in in the time to come but for now let's just keep it in our head that there is a connection interface which has a get get start and get end method and then there is a vehicle interface which has a traverse method which takes a connection and tells you whether uh, it was possible to traverse or not right now you can see that there are different child classes of this interface so for vehicle you can see that there is something called as car there is something called as car so this car implements vehicle because it implements vehicle it has to implement this traverse method okay we'll talk about the body of this method but for now you can see that there is a traverse method inside it and as i told you a car has a weight and that weight is an important factor right so it has an additional data called as weight and using this weight uh, probably we'll be doing something you can see that there is a get weight method over here through which we can return it uh, then there is another child class of vehicle which is called as a boat and as discussed boat has a flag has wheels because i told you certain boat can have wheels and certain won't have wheels and then every boat has a weight also so you can see that i am supplying these two data inside the constructor and then it has a traverse method which it is implementing we'll talk about it later and then you have getters for wheels and uh, you have getters for that flag and for uh, weight so for now you can see that there is an inter interface vehicle and then there are two concrete implementations of it car and boat right should be better to extend for a boat with wheels why think about it why and come up with why then we can talk about it for now i just used a boolean flag and it is not giving me any pain it if it gives me pain then i can th then i can probably think about changing it right okay uh cool so yeah now the next thing we have to model this graph we have to model this graph in some form now uh in case of dsa you used an adjacency list where you had a vector uh, where you had multiple vectors right so uh, for every node you maintained a vector of the nodes which are directly attached to it what to do in this case 
So in this case, from every node, there are multiple connections which are coming out. Yes or no? There are multiple connections. And that connection or that edge, whatever you call it, it, it can have any type. I mean, it could be a, a roadway connection. It could be a waterway connection. So what I have done is that I have created a separate class and I have named it connection map. And if you look at it, this class contains something which is a map of integer to list of connection. Now this should ring a bell in your head. So what we are doing actually over here is that if there is a planet, let's say there is a planet whose ID is uh, one, then the planet with planet ID one, it has a list of connections. So let's say there are multiple edges coming out of it. The first edge that comes out of it is a waterway connection. And the second edge is a roadway connection. The third is again a waterway connection. So basically in order to store these details, I have kept a map where the key is the identifier of my planet or my node. And the value is a list of edges, the list of connections which are coming out of it. Now, every connection has the relevant details that I need to seek from it. How? Because if you look at the definition of connection interface, it has a get start island method and it has a get island method, get end island. So I can get to know that, yeah, what is the starting and the ending point of this edge? I can get to know that. And I can also call these methods to check whether traversal is possible or not. Again, I have not touched these methods for now. Just stay tuned for a while. Let's just focus on this part. So you can see that this very important thing is in place. Now, because I have to build this map, uh, just like when you build a graph, you, you build your adjacency list. So here there is a method called as add connection. So whenever you are adding a particular connection, it's just like adding a directed edge in this graph. So the first thing that you do is you check the starting point you get what is the start island or what is the start planet, whatever it is. And now you check whether this map contains that key or not. Because if it contains that key, that means uh, there must be a list already. So in that case, you will simply put inside that list. I mean, so, sorry, this case is that if it does not contain, if, if this map does not contain that start island, then you will, uh, you will uh, create a raw list, uh, an empty list corresponding to that start island. And if it contains, then you will simply do a get, you will get the list and you will add to that list. So this is a simple adder. This is a simple adder for a new edge inside your graph. And what is your graph? Your graph is nothing but a map of uh, integer to list of connections. So you're basically adding connections inside it. Now there is a get connections method for a particular identifier. So let's say a planet has an ID zero and you want to get all the edges which are emanating out of that. So you can simply uh, return connections.getid and you will get the list of connections which are emanating out of that. So this is all about this class. Do you guys understand what is the responsibility of this class and why do we have it in the first place? You can just type in yes or no. Yes, this is a directed graph as shown to you in the question. Everyone else? Yeah. Okay. So this was our connection map. Okay. Now let's get back to a few important details. See, if you go back to the original question, I had told you that, uh, let's say you are currently at planet one and then uh, at planet one, you have got a vehicle, which is a boat. And now there is an edge coming out of it, a connection coming out of it, uh, which is linking it to three, right? And let's say it is road. So now you cannot just blindly traverse this. You have to check whether this boat can traverse this connection or not. So I'm writing whatever I have said, whether this boat can traverse this road or not. Now, in generic terms, I can rewrite it as whether this vehicle can traverse this connection or not. Because what is boat? Boat is a kind of vehicle. 
what is road road is a kind of connection so these are the checks that i would want to do because i don't want to have a separate handling for boat a separate handling for uh, a particular kind of connection <clears throat> i don't want all that i want to depend on abstract types so this is a very important design principle that you should code against abstract types so that you do not have to worry about the if else conditions and nitty gritty details of small small concrete types it's a very important design principle to be kept in head okay uh, now uh, if you take a look i have also created something called as island it's same as planet so you can see every island or planet has an identifier now every island or planet you know uh, it has a particular vehicle which is present over there right and every island you know it it also holds a reference to connection map i mean it's the same connection map it just holds a reference to it a pointer to it okay and then there is a get id get vehicle and then there is a method called as get connections so when you call get connections you can just do connection map dot get connections for the id and then you will get all the edges which are emanating out of that particular island or that particular uh, planet whatever it is okay now that we understand this idea uh, let's think how things are going to happen so let's head back to our previous class connection map so ideally you would want to check whether this vehicle can traverse this connection or not now if you remember inside the vehicle interface that was the exact signature of the method traverse certain connection how is this method to be implemented for any vehicle any vehicle let's say let's take example of car how should car implement this method traverse method can you think about it don't don't think in terms of code <clears throat> think in terms of logic the logic would be to first identify the type of this connection if the type of this connection is a water then hey i'll not be able to traverse if the type of this connection is a road then let me have a look at my weight so here also an if check is going to come because if you have to determine that what is the type of this connection and then act accordingly then you will end up having if checks based on the type of connection uh do, do you get this point it's it's a very important thing to understand and what we want to do is we want to prevent that from happening we we do not want that we have a separate if check for uh the roadway connection we have a separate check uh, check for waterway connection and all such sorts of things so in order to avoid this we have done a very intelligent thing and this is actually a design pattern how many of you have ever heard about visitor design pattern you just type in a yes if you have ever heard about visitor design pattern so what we are using over here is a visitor design pattern but even if you don't know about it there is no issue with it i'll tell you what it does see when somebody calls vehicle dot traverse connection like when we called vehicle dot traverse connection then the traverse method of that particular vehicle got invoked so for instance if my vehicle is a car then this traverse method will be invoked and if my vehicle is a boat then this traverse method will be invoked so basically the request is dispatched to this method right to this traverse method now what we do over here is in connection interface that i had shown you i had hidden these methods from you now i'll explain you these methods so there is a method can traverse which takes a car and then there is a method traverse which takes a car similarly i mean these two methods are simply overloaded here for both right so what we actually can do is we can call can traverse for a particular kind of vehicle and if it returns as true then only we will call traverse method similarly if it is a boat we will call can traverse for that boat and if it returns true then only we will call traverse so now if you look at the code you will relate a lot so what we are doing inside uh, let's say car is that we are doing connections dot 
can traverse. We are saying if connection dot can traverse this. And what is this? This is actually this car. So if connection dot can traverse this, then only we are going to call connection dot traverse. This is a mechanism of double dispatch. So first time when the traverse was called, the request was dispatched here. And second time the request is dispatched here. And in all these cases, you can see that we have protected ourselves from multiple if else, case, if else conditions that would have crept over here. Piyush has a very good point that is absolutely correct that we are depending on concrete classes here. Because if you look at the connection interface, it depends upon car, it depends upon boat. Now, tomorrow, if there is a helicopter, we will have to add that here also. But let me tell you, every design pattern, it offers you some benefit at the cost of some pain. Now, if that benefit is big, you embrace the pain. That's it. Every design pattern. No design pattern is picture perfect. If you talk about something like state design pattern, it is very powerful in cases where your system can be in multiple states. You don't need a lot of if else checks, but because there are a lot of states, they need to know about each other. So every design pattern has such cons. And yes, this design pattern has this con. So this is one major con of this design pattern that tomorrow, if you introduce a new kind of vehicle, you will have to introduce more methods over here. Yeah, that is. But what is the benefit that we are getting? The benefit is simplification at this layer. I mean, if you talk about vehicles, the, the code inside the vehicle is super simple. It doesn't have to do a lot. So now once you get this idea, you can see that this connection method, why it has these methods. You can, you can now clearly relate why this connection method has this method, uh, why this connection interface has this method. So, so just think from top to bottom. To begin with, you will call vehicle.traverse connection. Vehicle is also an abstract type. Connection is also an abstract type. But when you call vehicle.traverse, Depending upon the type of vehicle, the corresponding traverse method will be invoked. So if your vehicle was a car, then the traverse method of car will be invoked, right? And now connection is also abstract. Connection is also abstract. So you ended up putting checks inside connection for different, different types of vehicles. So inside connection, you have a method called as can traverse for car can traverse for boat, you'll have can traverse for helicopter, aeroplane, everything. And that will make sure that if can traverse is being called from car, then this particular method will be called, right? And if can traverse was called from boat, then this particular method will be called. Automatically it will be called. So this is what double dispatch is. Do you understand it maybe? 50, 60% at least, even if not all. How many of you get what, what I mean by double dispatch over here and why we are using that? You can just type in. So just in case if you don't get that, you need some practice, you know, because the important precursor for low level design is a good enough practice of oops and all. So when we also teach low level design in our course, uh, we first teach clean coding principles and oops. Only when you are very good with that, we move on to the design principles, then the design patterns, and then the case studies, and then the concurrency, and then the other, you know, blah, blah, complicated things. So there is, you know, the learning is always scaffolded, right? Anyways, come to the most important point. So now you can see that we have a particular class called as roadway connection. Roadway connection is an implementation of connection interface. Okay. Every connection should have a start island and island and roadway connection has a weight limit also. So you can see that these three data are being injected inside the constructor. Now get start island returns this, get end island returns this, everything is super clear. How to implement can traverse for a car? If you have to implement this method inside a roadway connection, how will you implement? You will implement it by checking whether the weight of the car is smaller than or equal to the weight limit or not. If it is smaller than or equal to the weight limit, then you will return true. Otherwise, you will return false. So you can see this is how can traverse is implemented for car inside roadway connection. But now let's look at waterway connection. 
in waterway connection which is another implementation of connection interface if you look at can traverse for a car it just returns false and why it should not because car cannot go through water so it returns false in this case right okay similarly let's move on to another method if you look at can traverse method for a boat can traverse method for a boat inside waterway connection then it should always return true and that is what it is doing but can you think the, the can traverse method uh, inside roadway connection should that also always return true can boat always traverse through a roadway connection just think about it let's say there is an edge and that edge is a roadways can the boat uh, uh, traverse over it yeah yes so that's the point so uh, if you look at roadway connection class and if you look at the can traverse for boat this is the code which is written over here so so now can you connect the different dots can you connect like how different things are falling into the place and how we are implementing and why we are implementing this way similarly traverse method so traverse for a car inside roadway connection once somebody called traverse we can traverse so we are just printing something traverse method for boat when somebody calls traverse we simply traverse and you know uh, the the way things have been designed at the side of a vehicle every vehicle first checks first checks whether can traverse or not if can traverse returns true then only it performs the traversal otherwise it simply returns false right similarly you can look at all the other remaining methods over here they are all super simple method uh, it's waterway connection can traverse for a car returns false traverse for a car always throws an exception because we can never traverse waterway through a car so we throw throw an exception and it it makes sense to do that okay uh, can traverse for a boat and then traverse and then all these things so i believe now you understand the different pictures so how is the picture there is there are two super types vehicle and connection for vehicle there are multiple forms boat and car for connection there are multiple forms roadway and waterway in the future many more varieties can also come up now let's look at the intelligent section of our code where the dfs part is going to exist so now i have written a class for now i have named it simulation you can name it better whatever you wish it has a method can traverse so what i'll do is i'll uh, i'll not read this method i'll want you guys to read this method so just take few minutes read this method and if you understand what this method is doing you can just type in a yes and if you do not understand what this method is doing you can type no Okay, Rachit is saying yes. He understood it. Very good. Anyone else who could understand apart from him? Isn't it a simple DFS? Isn't it a super simple DFS? And does it contain so many if else checks? that we were imagining at the beginning of the class like we thought if we want to build a game where there are so many varieties of connections and vehicles we thought for a while that there can be so many if else conditions but do you see such if else conditions over here not at all and do you feel this code is super simple to understand it's very easy to read and understand what it is doing 
right? And why it has been achieved is because we have used a great low level design over here. This code does not know about car. It does not know about boat. Tomorrow, if you introduce helicopter, it will not be disturbed because as long as helicopter is a class which implements vehicle interface, the helicopter will have inside it the required methods, right? And once it has the required methods inside it, then the job is done and I don't need anything else. Like it will have a traverse method inside it. If you have introduced a new class helicopter, and if that helicopter implements vehicle, it will have a traverse method. So I'll simply call vehicle.traverse and if that vehicle was helicopter, that will automatically get invoked, right? Similarly, if you introduce a new connection, let's say you introduce a connection which contains mud inside it, a muddy connection. You don't have to do anything. I mean, you do not depend upon roadway connection and waterway connection. You, you just depend upon connection, which is an interface. and and it, it contains a method inside it, get end island and uh, all other important things, uh, whichever is needed. So basically you, you depend upon abstract types. If you depend upon abstract types, you can code your intelligence engine against those abstract types without dealing about the small, small things. So tomorrow, if your product manager feels that, hey, in order to enhance the user experience, we want to bring in helicopters also, then he will not contact algorithmic developer. He will contact some maybe uh, a program analyst or somebody like that, who will just write a new class called as helicopter, right? And uh, make that class implement that interface and code the simple methods inside it, that's it. This thing will not change. Now, think about one thing. Uh, the current logic that we have over here is a DFS-based logic. Isn't it? Yes or no? It's a DFS-based logic. Now, tomorrow you realize that, you know, DFS, DFS, it uses recursion, so it uses stack space. And if the stack space is a lot, we run out of memory for certain graphs. And, and now you wish to switch to BFS. If you wish to switch to BFS, can you do that pretty easily? without worrying about the different types of connections and different types of vehicles? Tell me, yes or no? Yes, you can do that. You can create a queue and in that queue, you can enqueue the different different vehicles and then, then you can get your job done. So we have bifurcated the intelligence engine from the configuration things. And this is one, uh, I would say, immense benefit of low level design. Because had you not done something like this, you would have been forced to, every time helicopter comes, you would have to put an if check for helicopter. Every time a new sort of connection comes, you would have to put if check over here. And in that case, this code would have become a nightmare for people to understand and take care of. I could see one of you even mentioned, Swastika said, uh, I wish I knew all these things before I started working as uh, SE. Yes, even uh, I also had this realization at certain point of time in my career because these things are not taught in colleges and universities. But let me tell you, I'm sure all of you will agree, those of you who are an SD1 or SD2 or in that range, have you not felt that these things matter a lot? In fact, much more than uh, your ability to solve hard questions on data structures and algorithms, these things matter inside your organizations to, to consider you for your promotions or higher roles. I mean, the quality of code that you produce and how good it is, because this is what impacts the productivity of an organization, whether they can ship features fast or not. So low level design is not just a fluke. I mean, it's a serious thing. It's a very, very important thing, okay? But the thing is that a lot of times, uh, you know, there are different blogs and different resources for low-level design. I have been through them. Many of them, unfortunately, are not correct. So when you understand low-level design, when, when you try to learn it, you have to be, you have to have, uh, you know, you have to exercise certain caution. Because if somebody taught you to design things wrongly, then you learn that wrong thing and then you keep replicating that. And then your learning journey is like, first you have to unlearn those wrong things. You will see like a lot many places you will see low level design of book my show and all. 
uh, you'll find a lot many solutions on internet and none of them takes care of design principles and patterns. They don't take care of it. Just writing different classes is not low level design. Do, do you get the point, right? How can we explain low level design to an interviewer? The, the way I did it to you, you figure out what are the different components. Like I figured out that, okay, I'm going to have a vehicle, I'm going to have a connection. Then you figure out what are the different types. Then you figure out the methods inside those interfaces. Then, so so that, that is the approach that you take. You figure out the different components and then uh, you figure out which, which parts of the system should have uh, different types and which part of the system should not have different types. And it's not a one day job. It's not even a one week job. It, it takes at least a few months to master these skills. But once mastered, these are very, very fruitful skill from the perspective of doing good at your current job and also in terms of switching your job, applying to any good company which checks your machine coding skill or anything like that. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so now those of you who did not understand code, it's simple code where, you know, whenever you do DFS, you check whether something is visited or not. So we keep track of the planets which are visited. Now, what we have to do, we have to go from a starting island to ending island. So if it ever happens that we reach at ending island, we can say that the answer is true. We have been able to do our job and then we can return from there. Otherwise, we do islands.get current. So, uh, you know, there is uh, a map in which this is a map of ID to island object. So every, you know, because I'm starting from a particular integer, so I had to build this map. You can do away with this thing if you want, but uh, for now I have kept it for simplicity sake. So from this map, you can get to know which island you are referring to. And then for that particular island, you can get to know which vehicle is stationed at that island. Okay. And then you can also get to know that uh, what are the connections which are emanating from that island. And then if the connection is not null, you iterate on all the connections. It's just like iterating on all the edges. And then you check, first check, you first check whether, uh, the place where that connection takes you, whether that is visited or not. So if the end island, it is not contained here. And on top of that, if the vehicle is capable of traversing that connection, then we recurse, that's it. So that's the complete idea. You know, you can do a quick check. So here you can see I'm building a connection map. So we have a connection map in which I have added a roadway connection. I have added a waterway connection, then another waterway connection, then another roadway connection. And then I have created three islands, in fact, four islands. And then I have called can traverse. So if I, if I were to run this piece of code, you know, looking at this data, you can build the map on your own. You can take out your pen and paper and try building the map. It's very easy. And then you can figure out whether it is possible to go from start island to end island or not. Let's check what is our start. Our start island is zero and we want to go to three. We want to check whether we want to go, whether we can go from zero to three or not. So it has returned false. And it basically tried traversing from here to here by boat. It went from zero to one by boat because I'm sure from zero to one, there was a waterway connection you can see, okay? And the weight limit was, uh, so, sorry, uh, yeah, there was a waterway connection here from zero to one. And at island zero, we had a boat. So we went from zero to one, right? Now, when we went to one, we can see that uh, there is no connection from one. I mean, there is no connection which is starting from one. So we could not progress ahead from there. But then we went from zero to two. So why we went from zero to two is because there is a waterway connection. So we went from zero to two. Now from two to three, there is a roadway connection whose weight limit is 101, okay? But on island two, the car which is present has a weight of 200. Because on island two, the car which is present has a weight of 200, it exceeds the weight limit. So it will not be able to traverse from two to three. But if I change this weight limit to 1001, and now if I make a call, most probably I believe we should be able to traverse if every part of the code and configuration is okay. Yes, it does. Zero to one by boat, nothing happened after one. So zero to two by boat and two to three by car and then return true. 
Did it all make sense? Okay, so uh, it was too little of a time and too much has been conveyed. So uh, one thing which would help you a lot is if you note down the things that you have learned. So those of you who are already making notes, good job. If you are not making notes, in that case, just note down whatever you have learned from this class. And we will be doing a short, uh, uh, you know, a short kind of competition also. So in that, what we are going to do is we have Arshi here with us. So Arshi will share a LinkedIn URL with you. Yeah, that's the LinkedIn URL. You can find it. You can, all of you can please click on this LinkedIn URL. So here we have just uh, mentioned that we have done this event. And now we want to find the person who got the most out of this class. So how you can let us know what you understood from the classes, you can probably reshare this post. You can repost it, okay? And you can summarize your learning of this class. Uh, you can write a 50, 100, 200 word summary that these were the important things which you were able to learn. Arshi will forward it to me and I'll figure out that who probably summarized it the best. And then we have giveaways for that. Arshi, what's the giveaway? I don't uh, remember. I think we have some goodies which includes t-shirts and probably some free subscription for certain days to our low level design course. Yes. So the, that is what you have, right? Can you say yes. that again? Like two, that. Yes, uh, two weeks of LLD course subscription of Programming Pachala along with a uh, Programming Pachala merch t-shirt. Okay, that's cool. That'll be cool. Okay, so you guys can click on this link and whatever you have learned, whatsoever you have learned, if you want me to uh, check it and give comments on that, and also, if you turn out to be uh, the best summarizer, grab the offers, feel free to share this post uh, and comment whatever you have learned. Uh, so like when you repost something on LinkedIn, it gives you an option to do that. Cool. So uh, I think that was it from uh, my side for this session. I hope you guys kind of uh, found it useful on Saturday evening. Uh, now, if you have any question, if there is anything in general that you wish to ask, you can ask. We can do a quick five-minute Q&A, uh, and then probably we can wrap it up. UML diagram. You know, UML diagram and all, I'll tell you, like, I have taken some low-level design interviews, and I have given also some. I'll tell you that this is the last thing that your um, interviewer would look out for if you have explained him the components in general. If you have explained him that, okay, these are the interfaces, these are the methods within those interfaces. No, you don't have to fill in the code. You just specify these are the interfaces. This is the class. This is the relation. Weaving them together is not a hard thing to do. And for a lot of case studies in our uh, course, we have done that. But we have not repeated it everywhere because that's very mundane and that offers no benefit. Okay. Yeah, I know because uh, there are there is this trend of learning low-level design where people create boxes and sequence diagram and UML diagram. I'll not hesitate from saying that that is useless that in fact is useless. Because if you are unable to build an end-to-end -end system, like what I built right now in this one and a half hour, I could have built those boxes and diagrams. Useless. But instead of that, I actually ended up building an end-to-end -end system. And that is what matters, a system that runs. So that is what is actually expected in low-level design interview. And if you know that, you can draw any kind of diagram. What is a UML diagram? You mention your interfaces, classes. We have done that in some of the case studies, just to make sure that you get hang of all these things we have done. But, but I'll tell you very frankly, we have not repeatedly done that in all the case studies. And anyone who understands the, the design principles well, design patterns well, has done good amount of case studies, these things are, you know, quite simple. It, this is just like, you know, this UML diagrams are just like, let's say you're sitting for a DSA interview and somebody asks you a hard question on dynamic programming and you have coded it. And now you are afraid of what will happen if he asks me flowchart. So it's just like that. The, the hard part is the algorithm, the coding that you have done. And now you're worried about flowchart. You should never be. 
that flow chart thing is the umlm class diagram over here not really a big thing irrespective of how you learn that's not the thing to invest your effort into effort should be invested in learning design patterns principles and the important case studies and truly writing the code rather than just designing the boxes okay yeah okay anything else can you conduct one session where we get to know about the about how interview happens for LD, HLD, how a responder has to, uh, you know, uh, like in our course, every uh, like uh, case study that we have built is in exact this format. So there are two people there, there is me and then there is a person sitting with me and there is an interview dialogue which is happening. So that's the best replica, actually. Uh, if some of you, those of you who, who would have taken a free trial, of our course. Arshi, you can share the link uh, for people to probably take a free trial if they wish to. In the free trial also, you will get to see uh, certain free videos where the interaction is uh, just how it happens in case of an interview. Low level design, contrary to DSA is supposed to be highly interactive in nature. I mean, your interviewer will have questions, counter questions, new set of requirements, and you have to adapt to those. Okay, yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, that's the link which Arshi has shared. You guys can try that out. Uh, there is a case study on chess. So if you take a free trial, there is a case study on chess. It's a beautiful case study. So you will enjoy it more than what you probably would have enjoyed in this session. And you'll get a true glimpse of how uh, you know, uh, like in an interview, what are the expectations? There are many thick books for low level design. Gang of Four is one book. All 14, uh, 15, whatever design patterns are there, they are listed in those. So if you wish, you can go ahead and study those also. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Cool so then that will be it. I hope you guys had a good time. Uh, let us know of your uh, learnings by summarizing it on LinkedIn and we'll get back to you with goodies if you do well. Okay, cool then, bye.